Okay, so this morning we're going to go back into Romans chapter 9, and I've already mentioned to you in things that I've said and in my uh, prayer that we're going to be looking at specifically at, at God's election. Now, we've already looked at it before, the end of chapter 8, beginning of um, chapter 9. Uh, last time we were in Romans chapter 9, we were looking at God's discrimination among the uh, different, you know, the patriarchs and their children. Uh, to note that the uh, promise given in the commandments that, um, well, first of all, the threat that God would uh, visit the iniquity of, of those who hate him to the third and fourth generations. You know, he would withhold his mercy down that particular line, but that he would show mercy to thousands, thousands of generations, that, you know, for those who love him, doesn't mean that everyone down that line is going to be saved. As a matter of fact, it's, that's not going to be the case from all the examples we see in Scripture. But what we want to see is, again, God's absolute justice in choosing some and, and passing over uh, others, uh, that God can do this and be just. We see that he does it. Paul's going to deal with the objection. How can God do this and still be just? So we're looking at God's justice in his sovereign mercy. Well, this is the passage, Romans 9, 14 through 24. What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up, to demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then he has mercy on whom he desires and he hardens whom he desires. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who resists his will? On the contrary, who are you, O oh man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? Or does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory, even us, whom he also called, not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. Now again, as I've read this, <laughs> I, I was thinking, Paul is not necessarily an easy person to understand, and I think we understand that. So we're going to have to kind of work our way through this to see exactly what he is saying. But before we do, we do want to get a little bit of a running start and just see what Paul has been saying up to this point. Now, having explained to, to the Romans, and, and instead of just saying to the Romans, third person, I'm going to say to us, okay, because he's explaining this to us. The Romans, you know, we're primarily Gentiles, and, and we're Gentiles, and this applies to us as much as it did to them, but having explained to us the limitless, infinite blessings God has given to us through the Lord Jesus Christ that are ours in Christ, and more specifically in chapter 8, that God's going to work all things together for our good, including making sure that nothing is going to keep us from finally arriving safely into heaven. Okay? Paul has been addressing the question that some might raise, and maybe you'll recognize this from what we saw a couple of weeks ago. What about the Jews? What about the Jews? God made the same promises to them. But most of them failed to receive what God promised. They didn't receive these blessings. And if they didn't, how can we be sure that we will? Well, the way that Paul goes about answering this question is, first of all, he affirms his great love for the Jews. Remember that. That he would willingly be cut off from Christ. Actually, condemned, separated forever. If through his sacrifice, 
he might bring his countrymen to receive Christ. Paul, after that, went on to argue that God's promises have not failed. God did not, you know, he didn't renege on these promises. Because, remember in verse 6, he said, they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. And what he means by that is that the Israel he made the promise to, the chosen ones, are not all descended from Israel or from the man, Jacob, who was renamed Israel. God never promised to save all of Jacob's children, nor did he promise to save all of Abraham's or all of Isaac's. He says in verse 8, it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. Now again, to put it in more familiar terms, what he's saying is God's promise applies only to the elect. To those whom Paul said in, in chapter 8, verse 29, those whom he foreknew, those whom he foreloved. Okay, it applied to Isaac, but not to Ishmael or the other children of Abraham. It applied to Jacob, but not to Esau. It applied to some of Jacob's children, but not all. And Paul argues at the end of our text this morning, it applies to some Gentiles as well, and not just to the Jews. Now, from this, Paul considers a possible objection that he has to address, he feels he must address, to vindicate God from charges that could be brought or likely were brought against him. And the charge is this. Can God really discriminate? I mean, this is discrimination, isn't it? It is, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, okay? God, can, can, can he discriminate like this, show mercy to some but not to others, and still be righteous, still be just. Now, in answering this, Paul is going to quote two Old Testament passages, one passage where God tells Moses that he will show mercy on whom he, has, on whom he wills, okay? And in the second passage, where he commissions Moses to tell Pharaoh specifically that God raised him up in order that he might judge him and show the world his power demonstrated to the world, in that judgment. Now, again, it doesn't sound like the typical way that we might answer the question, how can God do this and be just? But this is the way Paul will answer the question, and we'll see why. But since this second example of Pharaoh raises an even more interesting question, more objections against God, Paul also addresses this question. If God hardens whom he wills, can he really hold us, can he really hold anyone accountable for their sins because we're just doing his will? Well, again, Paul's going to address that. So first of all, Paul begins with the first objection. Now, I'm going to try to make this as clear as I can, so if I fail, come and talk to me afterwards and I'll try to explain it. Okay, the first objection is in verse 14. What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? The answer is, may it never be. Now, in the Greek language, Paul words this question in a way that expects a negative answer. He expects the answer to be no. There is no injustice with God, is there? No. Okay. But he also answers the question in the strongest possible way to deny it. May it never be. May this absolutely never happen. Now, how does he prove this statement, okay, that God isn't unjust, he can't be unjust, that could never possibly happen? Well, he does it by quoting two Old Testament passages, as I mentioned. The first one is God's declaration to Moses of his divine right to choose, an assertion that God makes, that is his right. Now, this happens on the occasion, remember, when, when Moses wanted to see God's glory. By the way, that's something that everyone who loves God should want to see because what Moses was asking God to see in that occasion was the beatific vision. He wanted to see the beauty of his glory. And God graciously answered that request. Now, to see the glory of God meant that, of course, you had to be brought near to the Lord, and that's really what Paul is emphasizing here. We read in Exodus 33, 19, this, this was God's response to Moses. I myself will make all my goodness pass before you 
and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. Now, that statement, that's where Paul's quoting it from. That can mean one of two things. God could be saying, well, this is part of my character. I am gracious to whom I'll be gracious and uh, show compassion on whom I show compassion. Or it could be the answer to Moses' request that, Moses, you've made this request and I'm going to grant it. I'm going to show you this grace. I'm going to show you this mercy. I'm going to draw you near to me. Now, remember, there were certain provisos here that he would only be able to see the trailing edges of his glory. You know, he puts him in the cleft of the rock and covers it, and God makes all his goodness pass before him. And then as he's passed by, he removes his hand, so to speak, and Moses sees only the trailing, you know, the trailing edges of his glory for his own protection because God said, no one can see my face and live. And by the way, once we're in heaven, standing before the Lord, we will see his face and we will live because then we will be perfectly righteous and able to see it. But God's choice to bring Moses near in this way was an act of his sovereign good pleasure. And Paul wants us to know that it wasn't because Moses was such a righteous guy. He writes in verse 16, it does not depend on the man who wills, not because Moses wanted to, or the man who runs. It wasn't because of all the good things that Moses did. But the reason why God allowed him to come near and see that glory was because of his mercy. Okay? That's the only reason anyone draws near to God is because of his mercy. Now, I think we understand that, but let's go on to the second example, and then we'll, we'll circle back to deal with both of these. Second, Paul quotes what God told Moses. He wanted him to say to Pharaoh when Moses went to tell him to let God's people go. In chapter, 17, or excuse me, in chapter 9, verse 17, For this very purpose I raised you up, Pharaoh, to demonstrate my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. Now, what Moses was, God was telling Moses to say to Pharaoh was this, that not only, Pharaoh, am I going to withhold my mercy from you, by which you could be saved, but I'm actually going to harden you. I raised you up, and I'm going to make sure that you're not going to turn from your sins so that I can bring my judgments on you so that the world might know who I am and they might fear my name. He said to Moses in Exodus 4, verse 21, When you go back to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders which I have put in your power. But notice this, and this is probably the hardest passage in all of Scripture to understand. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Okay? Why was God going to do that? Well, he was going to harden his heart so he would let the people go so that God could bring his judgments on Pharaoh and his people so that all the world could see the justice of God and his power and his name would be known throughout the entire world. That's what he chose to do to Pharaoh. God not only chooses whom he's going to bring near, such as he did in the case of Moses, but also those that he is going to pass over and he's going to judge. So then Paul's conclusion from both of these examples and both of these statements is this in verse 18. So then, he has mercy on whom he desires and he hardens whom he desires. Okay, that's the conclusion from both of these passages. He drew Moses near, but he hardened Pharaoh's heart. God has mercy on whom he wills and he hardens whom he wills. Now, Remember, Paul is answering an objection here. The objection is, can God do this and be just? And what has Paul done? He's, he's simply gone to the Old Testament and affirmed that God did this and that he is just. And the question is, how does that prove it? Okay. It may seem that he's just simply affirming that God has the right to do whatever he wants and still be just. If he wants to soften hearts, he may. If he wants to harden hearts, he may. But there really is more involved in this. And again, this is where we have to take the whole, the whole picture. But first of all, we should understand that this touches on an old debate. Okay? It's been in the church for years. And the debate is this. 
is, is something right, are things right and good because God does them? You know, do his choices, whatever he chooses, become the standard of what's right and then what's contrary to that is wrong? Or does God do something because it's right? Now, some people object to that second idea that God does things because they're right because it seems to place an authority over God, that there's a standard over him that he has to submit to. Okay, well, we know it can't be that. Okay, uh, there's no authority greater than God. But the answer to this dilemma, and really I think it's behind what Paul is saying here, is, is both, okay? Whatever God does is right because he always does what's right. God is righteous. He is the standard of righteousness. He cannot do anything but, but what is right. And that is the answer to the question. That is how God can be just because God is always just and whatever he chooses to do is just. Now, that's kind of the ultimate answer to the question, isn't it? That means if God shows mercy, he's just. If he hardens, he's just because he can't be other than just. But that's the way Paul answers the question here, but I want us to understand that he's, he's shown us already more about the justice of God, and we need to understand that if we're going to understand his justice. So to see it more clearly, we need to remember these three things. First of all, what we and all mankind really deserve. Secondly, that there is a difference between justice and what we call fairness. And thirdly, that God can harden without being the author of sin. Now, let me just develop each of those really briefly. We do need to remember what Paul said in the first three chapters of this book. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're all guilty. We all deserve damnation. Now, I mentioned before, we've been looking at this letter for several months, and we've probably forgotten what Paul has said. But the Romans wouldn't have, who had this letter read to them in one sitting. It would have been fresh in their minds, okay? We need to remind ourselves the state of mankind is in, okay? We're all guilty. We all deserve judgment, not just a slap on the wrist, not just a few thousand or million years in a purgatory, but we deserve everlasting damnation in hell. That's what we deserve when we were conceived because of the sin of Adam. And we've earned it many times over since we've been in this world. We really shouldn't be asking ourselves the question because this is the question most people ask. How could God harden Pharaoh's heart? How could God pass over anyone? That's not the question we really should be asking, really. How God can pass over some in his mercy and be just? Because that is what everybody deserves. You know, that's what justice demands, is that everyone who is guilty be held accountable for that guilt and be justly punished. That's not the question Paul is saying we should be asking. The question we should be asking is, how can God show mercy and still be just? Now that we know the answer to, but we're going to come back to that in, in a few moments. So this, that's the first thing. We need to remember the state we're in. That's what we deserve. Secondly, we need to remember it isn't unjust for God to be unfair. You know, how can God discriminate? We, you know, discrimination is something that is really a bad word in today's culture, but we need to understand that God does discriminate. Sometimes we tend to think of these two, two terms, you know, justice and fairness, as synonymous terms, but they really have quite different definitions. Justice means giving somebody what they deserve, whether it's good or bad, you know, whether it's reward or punishment. But fairness means treating everybody equally. It means treating everybody the same. Now, these are two different questions, right? Does God treat everyone the same? Is God fair? Well, the answer to that is obviously not, okay? That's what Paul is telling us. God does not treat everybody the same, right? But is it unjust that he doesn't treat everybody the same? Well, the answer, of course, is a resounding no. As a matter of fact, that is, is incorporated into everything that we do and everything that Jesus did and everything that God does. Okay, we, we show this unfairness in our own relationships, don't we? I mean, as husbands, 
we treat our wives differently than all the other wives in the world, right? We, we make a distinction between them. And wives, you do the same thing for your husbands. Is that unfair? Well, yes, it's unfair. But is it just? Well, of course, it's, it's, it's just. It's not unjust. This is what God commands us to do. Now, as parents, we love and care for our children more than the children of other people. Now, is that fair? No, that's not fair. But is it just? Well, of course it is. Jesus, you realize Jesus had favorites. He had his inner circle, Peter, James, and John, the ones he kept taking you know, by you know, with him when he would do certain things that, that they were only, the only ones privy to. Was it fair for Jesus to do that? No, because he didn't treat all the disciples the same. But it wasn't unjust. You know, it was merciful that they were in the group at all. Now, God, what Paul is telling us here is that God does not treat everybody the same, okay? He shows mercy to some, and he leaves others to the consequences of their guilt. It's not fair, okay? But it's just. It is just. God is just. So we need to understand there's a difference between those two terms. So, you know, everyone has fallen in sin, deserves damnation, and again, uh, justice and fairness are not equal they're not the same terms. The third thing we need to, to bear in mind is God can harden and not be unjust because we usually think of that hardening as making him the author of sin, right? Isn't that the problem that arises? God hardened Pharaoh's heart? Does that mean God's injecting sin in his heart? Well, it's one thing for God not to show Pharaoh mercy, but how do we explain the fact that he hardened his heart? Well, again, that's really quite easy once we understand point one, that all of us have sinned and the condition that sin brings our hearts into. God did not have to inject evil into Pharaoh's heart to harden it, okay? All he had to do was to use the evil that was already present in his heart. Now, God generally restrains sin by his Holy Spirit. I mentioned that earlier, remember. This is what we call common grace. That's why... When we read Romans chapter 3 and we see the description of mankind, but then we look at the people around us and we say, hey, they don't look like they're that bad. Well, it's because God is restraining sin by his Holy Spirit. It's what we call common grace. He does it to preserve the church. Now, his church in Pharaoh's day, his church was in Egypt. That was the church. Those were his people. And how did God make sure that Pharaoh was not going to destroy his people, but rather take care of them? Well, he did it by restraining the sin in Pharaoh's heart, especially when um, Joseph was alive. Remember how, how things went well for Israel? But then he withdrew some of that restraint when uh, Joseph died and another Pharaoh you know, was raised up that um, uh, didn't know Joseph and he began to treat them harshly. Well, that was part of that removal of that restraint. And, and so, you know, um, more of this evil expresses itself. So how does God harden Pharaoh's heart in the instance where he doesn't want Pharaoh to let the people go? All he does is withdraw this restraint even further and allow the sin that's in Pharaoh's heart to harden that heart so that he won't let the people go. Now the question is, is that unjust for God to do that? Well, no, it's not unjust because he didn't owe Pharaoh that restraint in the first place, and he wasn't doing it for Pharaoh. He was doing it for his people. God doesn't owe even that mercy to anyone, and he can withdraw it any time that he pleases. Okay? He can have mercy on whom he desires. He can harden whom he desires and be absolutely righteous and just. Okay, if that doesn't make sense, talk to me afterwards, and we'll try to work through that. Okay, but now this this point that Paul brought up about hardening Pharaoh's heart, that conclusion suggests one more objection that could be raised. And the objection is in verse 19. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? That is with me. For who resists his will? Now, you know, it was said of Jonathan Edwards, okay, that when he engaged, you know, his opponents in theological debate and argument, that he not only demolished all of their arguments, but he also thought of arguments that they hadn't thought of yet. 
And he demolished those as well. It was called a dusting off of the spot, you know, in which they, they stood. So he destroys them and he dusts off the spot. Well, that's what Paul is doing here to his opponents. He's, again, dealing with all their objections and perhaps even some that they haven't thought of yet. The question is, if God exercises this kind of sovereignty over mankind, if God especially hardens whom he desires, then how can he blame anyone for their sin? After all, aren't we just doing what God ordained that we would do? The answer to the question should be obvious. He can blame. Yes, he can blame us, even if he passes us over in his mercy, because we're guilty, okay? That's what we need to bear in mind. There's nothing unjust with God leaving the guilty the consequences of their sins, even the full brunt of their sins, even in this life. When people sin, when, when Pharaoh sinned by not letting God's people go, that was because Pharaoh, that's what he wanted to do. God's just simply holding him accountable for the choices that he is making because he has a sinful and wicked heart. God is not making anyone sin. Now again, Paul uses this very famous analogy of the potter and the clay. And he says, just as the potter has the right to make from the same lump one pot for honorable use, by which perhaps he means to store ointment or perfume, maybe a, a fine pot, you know, or another one for common use, and we can only imagine what those common uses may be, but maybe storing grain or water, you know, things that are more common. So he says God has the right to choose from fallen mankind. Now, notice, we have to assume that this lump of clay that God is working with here, you know, the potter, is fallen mankind, okay? He has the right to make some objects of his mercy, but others the objects of his wrath. And again, the, the thing about the wrath is, is the part that gives us problems. He can choose to do that. He can choose to make some the objects of his wrath because they already deserve his wrath. They're not neutral. They're guilty. Okay. Now, Paul's already answered the question, but he does raise one other point here, and the question is, why does God do this? Why, why is he making some vessels for honor and other vessels for dishonor? Why is he choosing to save some but passing over others? And, you know, this, this really has to do, again, with another difficult principle that we, make, we have to make sure that we, that we grasp. And, and that is, God does everything he does for the same reason, okay? It's not because he has a wonderful plan for man's life, okay? But, it, and, but he does for some, okay? But it's because he wants to reveal his glory. He wants to show the world what he's like, that he is just and that he is holy, but also that he is gracious. His, you know, we, we saw that mixed together in... Um, the things that we, were, that we were looking at, a God of faithfulness and without injustice, but he is also, you know, the earth is full of his loving kindness. So God is just and he's righteous, but he's also gracious and merciful. So why is God choosing some to show mercy on and choosing to pass over others? Well, he has mercy on some because he wants to glorify his love and his grace. You know, Paul says that God endured with patience those that he's prepared for wrath, the reason why he puts up with them, the reason why he bears with them for so long and allows them to exist in his world is because he wants to show the riches of his grace on those that he's determined to save. And if you understand what he's saying here, he's talking about common grace again. God preserves the world and he patiently puts up with the wickedness of mankind so that he can allow the world to continue so he can call his people out, those that he's going to have mercy on, so that he can show them the riches of his grace. You know, that's, that's what we see as believers, the riches of his grace. And Paul will say, not only from among the Jews, but also from among the Gentiles. And that's what he's going to focus on next. But again, from what Paul has told us in this passage, we really shouldn't be asking this question. How can God harden the hearts of some and still be just? Okay? 
He doesn't harden their hearts. He's just simply giving them over to what's already in their hearts because they're already wicked, okay? There's nothing unjust with that. That is perfectly just because that is what they deserve. The real question that we should be asking is how can God show mercy and still be just? Because if God gave everybody what they deserved, then all of us would receive that, that hardening and that wrath and God would demonstrate his justice and his holiness on every single one of us. Now, Paul answered how we can do this earlier, but obviously we need to repeat it now. He can do it because of what he has done through Jesus Christ. Remember, if there were no cross, there could be no mercy. There could only be justice, and that justice, well, I should say there could only be the negative part of justice, and that would be the consequences of our sin. But because of the cross, there is a just basis upon which God can show mercy. Okay. God can show us mercy because he has loved us from all eternity. Again, before the heavens and the earth were made, this is what Paul already told us in chapter 8. Those whom he foreknew, that means foreloving, okay, he determined to save us. He predestined us. He knew that we'd be guilty of Adam's sin, and in that love, he determined to make a payment, the only payment that could take away our sins by giving us his only begotten son. And we need to realize that this mercy is possible because the son, out of his love for us, was willing to make this payment, wasn't he? We need to remember what, what Jesus actually did, the son of God is represented as descending from heaven. He descends from heaven into the depths of the earth. And I think when Paul is talking about that, he's not talking about from the cross he descends into hell. But from heaven, he descends to this earth. And he lives among a sinful people in, in these depths of sin. Okay? Uh, he takes our nature and he lives among us. And again, I, I pointed out before, and as, as I'm sure you remember, when Peter talks about what Lot experienced when he was in Sodom and Gomorrah, how his righteous soul was tormented day after day by their lawless deeds, and they were wicked people. Well, Jesus descends into his own people who are in a wicked state, and he lives among them, and, and he's willing to do this, even to go to the cross, have our sins laid on him, and to suffer God's wrath and to die in our place. So the Father loves us, sends His Son. The Son loves us. He makes the payment. And the Spirit, who is, you know, as Jonathan Edwards would tell us, is what it is that Jesus actually purchases for us in His death. Out of His love, He comes and unites Himself to our souls and begins to work his holy nature in us so that he might present us to the Son as the reward the Father has chosen to give him for this work. The reason that God can show mercy and the only reason is because of what he has done through the Lord Jesus Christ. So the conclusion is, is this, God can pass us by in his mercy and be just. God can harden us in sin and be just. Or God can show us mercy, and he can be just. Let's be thankful this morning that he chose to show us his mercy. The only reason why you and I are here and not doing what the rest of the world is doing outside of uh, church, not worshiping God, the only reason why we love him, the only reason why we're trusting in him is not because that's what we willed. It's not because that's what we did, because somehow on our own strength and our own power, we decided to do this. It's only because God had mercy on us. He chose to draw us near and not to pass over us and leave us to our sins. So let's be thankful that God has done that for us. Well, let's, let's think about that as we prepare now to come to the table. And again, hopefully it will help us to uh, have a fresh perspective on, on the table and to rejoice in God's love and mercy. But let's, uh, let's pray.